me here. Hi. Right. Ah, okay. Well, it's um, time to start the you know, lecture today. So welcome everyone to um, today's um, multidisciplinary meeting. And we are very happy to have uh, Betty Villaforte uh, talk to us about hypophosphatasia. Uh, as you all, uh, many, you know, most of you know, Betty um, uh, it was uh, at UOL from 2003 to 2020 as a full-time uh, faculty member in endocrinology. Uh, she came here from Atlanta, um, from Emory. Uh, she had her interest in uh, insulin sensitivity and uh, insulin action, but also was an excellent uh, clinical endocrinologist with a broad knowledge of um, many aspects of endocrinology, and she has given us uh, wonderful lectures over the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and um, she, we are happy that she has continued her appointment here as a graduate faculty and um, has been engaged with us, um, teaching our fellows and uh, other members here on different topics. And today she will be talking about hypophosphatasia is an underdiagnosed disease. Thank you, thank you, Siri. Okay. Uh, I hope at the end of the talk, you know, we will learn uh, about the prevalence of this disease uh, and understand the role of alkaline phosphatase in skeletal mineral station. Uh, be able to identify the different types of hypophosphatasia and discuss the wide range of clinical presentation. And uh, we're going to discuss the treatment options for this condition, including the use of asphotase alpha. Okay. I have nothing to disclose, okay. I usually present an index case in which I try to learn as much as possible, especially with unusual cases. So this lady is a 48-year-old female. Uh, she was diagnosed as having rheumatoid arthritis at 11 years old. Between 11 to 17 years old, uh, she has lots of knee and foot pain and she has to see the rheumatologist regularly for all of this problem. As an adult, she had multiple foot surgeries for fractures of the feet. She had left knee surgery for osteoarthritis, and she had a left hip replacement two years ago. She also has two kidney stone surgeries, the first one in 2019 and the second one in 2021. And she came in with all her alkaline phosphatase reading and she said, we have relatives with hypophosphatasia. I want uh, you to check whether I have hypophosphatasia also. And these are her alkaline phosphatase level, all less than 40 unit per liter. Of course, since she has all this history of fractures, I did the usual osteoporotic um, workup, and her PTH level was normal, serum calcium level normal, vitamin D level was also normal. She has hypercalciuria, the 24-hour urine calcium was 319 milligram. She already had the ultrasound of the kidneys because she had all those kidney stones before, and it showed numerous small region of ring down artifact in both kidneys, suggesting small calicial tip stones bilaterally, meaning she has nephrocalcinosis. So the first thing I did was to check her vitamin B6, and it was elevated. Then the next step was to check her urine amino acid profile, and she has elevated phosphoethanolamine, 
this is the substrate that's elevated in hypophosphatasia. Hers was 319 nanomol per milligram creatinine. Normal is less than 48. And I sent her to a, you know, medical geneticist to extract her family history. And she, her maternal grandparents are first cousin from Kentucky. Her father is 69 years old. He has abnormal looking feet. She has a sister who's 45 years old and whose teeth tends to break and fall out. And she has untreated scoliosis, the sister. The sister, her sister has a daughter whose son was diagnosed with hypophosphatasia. The second daughter has scoliosis, dental issues, was diagnosed with hypophosphatasia and is being treated at Norton Hospital. And the patient's children uh, are these two. She has a 26-year-old son who had scoliosis surgery at 14 years old and had one healthy son. She also has a 24-year-old daughter who has normal alkaline phosphatase level and pseudotumor cerebri. And uh, we did the genetic test on this patient and she had the uh, point mutation in the alkaline uh, phosphatase gene, um, the DNA number 113, adenine to thymine substitution. Now, this patient is really symptomatic. So she had the classic history of pediatric onset hypophosphatasia. By contrast, I have another patient at U of L uh, he's a 24-year-old male with type 1 diabetes. I have been seeing him for four years for his type 1 diabetes. Then one day, I look at the alkaline phosphatase level, and it's all less than 40. So I check his vitamin B6 level, and it's elevated. So before he left for Nashville, he was going to graduate school in Nashville. I told him, you may have hypophosphatasia. You need to see an endocrinologist in Nashville to confirm it. But since you don't have symptoms and there's nothing wrong with your bone, uh, you may not have it. You know, you may have the mildest form. Uh, then the patient showed me his hands. And he said, is this why everything is crooked, <laughs> you know? And he can also bend all his joint, according to him. He can displace his knee and his, his uh, shoulder joint easily and then reconnect them, he said. And, but he never had any pain, so she, he has all this deformity. And I told him, why didn't you tell me? And he said, you did not ask, <laughs> you know. So it shows that it's important to do physical examination, including their limbs, actually, which we do not routinely do unless they have a specific complaint for that. So what are alkaline phosphatase? There's four isoforms of alkaline phosphatase. And there's four different genes encoding alkaline phosphatase. The first one is alkaline phosphatase P, which is specific to placenta. Second is alkaline phosphatase I, which is specific to the intestine. Third isoform is alkaline phosphatase G, which is specific to the germ cells. The hypophosphatasia problem involved this four, the fourth alkaline phosphatase, which is alkaline phosphatase L. This is the tissue non-specific enzyme, isoenzyme of alkaline phosphatase. So it's called tissue non, 
specific alkaline phosphatase. It's ubiquitously expressed in skeleton, developing teeth, liver, and kidney. It has high allelic heterogeneity and about 390 to 400 loss of function variants have been identified for this gene. So, hypophosphatasia is a rare inherited disorder caused by loss of function mutation of the nonspecific alkaline phosphatase gene. Um, it involves a multi-systemic disease. So it involves not only the bone, but also the muscles, kidney, lung, GI tract, peripheral, and central nervous system. The clinical expression is highly variable. It could be lethal to mild, and the most severe forms affects infants and young children. The characteristic clinical presentation is defective bone and tooth mineralization. So they have symptoms of rickets, osteomalacia, frequent fractures, and tooth loss. So what are the di how do you diagnose hypophosphatasia? First, you have to have low serum alkaline phosphatase level since about 95% of circulating alkaline phosphatase is the coming from this gene, the tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase, so we can easily measure it in the serum. And another criteria for diagnosing is, is you have to have increased level of alkaline phosphatase substrate. The substrates that requires alkaline phosphatase activity to convert it to something active. So you either have elevated inorganic pyrophosphate um, or elevated pyridoxal 5' phosphate. Uh, pyridoxal 5' phosphate is the active metabolite of vitamin B6. All we need is to order vitamin B6. And the third component is, a third substrate is phosphoethanol amine, or PEA, which you can easily measure. We usually send the sample to uh, Mayo Clinic. It's just a HPLC of the urine amino acid. So when you have mutation of the alkaline phosphatase gene, non-specific alkaline phosphatase gene, you will have deficient alkaline phosphatase activity and the substrate will, will accumulate, uh, including inorganic pyrophosphate, pyridoxal 5' prime phosphate, and phosphoethanol amine. Uh, we cannot measure the inorganic pyrophosphate because it is not uh, commercially available, but we can measure the vitamin B6 level and urine phosphoethanol amines. So what is the inorganic pyrophosphate? It's the inhibitor of hydro hydroxyapatite crystal formation and bone mineralization. And the vitamin B6 actually is elevated only in about half of the patient with hypophosphatasia. Not every patient will have elevated vitamin B6, although this is one of the more sensitive marker of the disease, more than low alkaline phosphatase level in terms of being sensitive. Uh, to hypophosphatasia. So what is, what is PA or, just a second, uh, phosphoethanol amine uh, level. These are degradation product of a cell surface phosphatidylinositol glycan anchor. So it's one of the component of the cell membrane. And about 75% of the patients with 
hypophosphatasia will have elevated uh, phosphoethanolamine. So these are the three products that usually accumulate. So what is inorganic pyrophosphate? Normally, inorganic pyrophosphate is dephosphorylated by the alkaline phosphatase into monophosphate. The monophosphate together with calcium is incorporated into the hydroxyapatite uh, crystal mineralization of the bone. And if you don't convert the inorganic pyrophosphate to monophosphate, this will accumulate and you can measure that in the serum of the patient. And this by itself not also has inhibitory effect on hydroxyapatite formation. So, uh, but as I said, this is not commercial, the measurement of inorganic pyrophosphate is not commercially available. So we measure the other things, you know. The alkaline phosphatase uh, activity involved many of the bone forming cell, including the tooth forming cell. So all of the alkaline phosphatase in these cells will not be working. So all of this will lead to accumulation of inorganic pyrophosphate. The other part is the phosphoethanolamine, which is a component of the phospholipid of the membrane. Uh, where it's degraded by uh, phospholipase C to PEA or phosphoethanolamine. This is further uh, degraded and metabolized into the monophosphate which is then incorporated into the hydroxyapatite formation of the um, bone mineralization. So if you are not, you know, um, you don't have the alkaline phosphatase activity, this also tends to accumulate, okay? And the third part that accumulates is vitamin B6. So the vitamin B6 in the circulation is not, or uh, is normally acted but dephosphorylated to pyridoxal in the brain by alkaline phosphatase because pyridoxal, not in the brain, in the circulation, pyridoxal can cross the blood brain barrier to enter the brain. Then Pyridoxal is phosphorylated back to pyridoxal uh, 5 prime phosphate, which is the active vitamin D, which is a cofactor of GABA formation. So uh, when you do not have alkaline phosphatase, there's decreased entry of pyridoxal into the brain. So you have low uh, vitamin B6 level and that will decrease the threshold for seizure. That's why uh, the seizure for hypophosphatasia is uh, pyridoxine dependent. However, in interpreting the alkaline phosphatase level, you should keep in mind that the normal range of alkaline phosphatase is different in different ages. It, it, there's a chart that will show you what is the normal range of alkaline phosphatase. And for example, if the patient is less than 10 years old, it has to be below 156 before you interpret it, treated their alkaline phosphatase as being low. In adults, in general, less than 40 is considered as low alkaline phosphatase level. But there are also many endocrine conditions that can lead to low alkaline phosphatase level. So this should be part of your differential diagnosis, including Cushing syndrome, hypothyroidism, osteogenesis imperfecta, 
cleidocranial dysplasia, hypophosphatasia, and some other condition, a dynamic bone disease sometimes, and also, more importantly, celiac disease and hemochromatosis. There's an extremely complicated mechanism by which uh, hemochromatosis led to decreased alkaline phosphatase level. Although we don't get a lot of consultation for decreased alkaline phosphatase level, uh, but you have to still go through this differential diagnosis before you consider hypophosphatasia. Now, on the other hand, we get lots of, you know, referral for alkaline phosphatase, high alkaline phosphatase level. And from the endocrine standpoint, we have to consider healing fracture, osteomalacia, Paget's disease of the bone, osteo osteogenic sarcoma, and bone metastasis, hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and subacute thyroiditis and osteosarcoma. So these are the differential diagnoses that we have to keep in mind when they come with elevated uh, alkaline phosphatase. So what is the human alkaline phosphatase gene? It's localized to chromosome 1. It has different, uh, seven different transcripts. Uh, it's an alternatively spliced gene. That's why we can dis distinguish between the liver and the bone-specific isoenzyme, which we do clinically uh, frequently. Uh, it consists of 12 exons, including 11 protein coding exons. 80% of the mutation of this gene is mis missense point mutation, like in the patient that I presented. 10% uh, has small deletions, 4% have splicing mutation, 3% uh, nonsense mutation, and the less common ones are complex insertion and deletion. So even though we consider the substrate to be the inorganic pyrophosphate, which will affect bone mineralization, uh, the other one is the vitamin B, B6, which can sometimes uh, cause the neurologic symptoms of hypophosphatasia, but there are other substrates like the ATP substrate that are involved in alkaline phosphatase activity. This is the main reason why they also present with muscle weakness. Oh, never mind. This is just to emphasize that the ATP production in the muscle cell can also be involved. And there are many other parts of the bone me uh, mineralization mechanism that's affected by the alkaline phosphatase, including the osteopontin system. Okay. Again, the way to diagnose hypophosphatasia is they usually have normal parathyroid hormone, normal vitamin D levels, both, both the 25-hydroxy and the dihydroxy vitamin D. They have normal calcium and ionized calcium level, and they have normal phosphorus level. They have elevated urine phosphoethanol, I mean, urine in organic pyrophosphate, and uh, serum pyridoxal 5' prime phosphate, which is the vitamin B6, and low alkaline phosphatase level. So you go just go through this criteria to make the diagnosis. There are different uh, types of hypophosphatasia in terms of clinical presentation. They could be perinatal, usually lethal, 
because there's a significant hypomineralization of the bone and they form osteochondral spurs. Uh, or alternatively, you could have a benign perinatal uh, presentation in which they have bowing of the long bone and they usually have benign postnatal cores or there's an infantile form in which you develop craniosynostosis so they have hypomineralization of the ribs the cranium and they have hypercalciuria we're mostly interested in these three cases because uh, three types because we're exposed to this one so childhood onset they present with short stature, skeletal deformity, bone pain, and fracture. And in adults, they usually have stress fractures of the feet. So the metatarsal bones are the ones that get fractured. They have tibial fracture, and they have also chondrocalcinosis. There's a subtype called odontohypophosphatasia in which they don't have other systemic presentation except for alveolar bone loss. They could be mild or severe. The severe one is uncommon, one per 300,000 people. Uh, they have severe deficit in bone mineralization, bowing of the bones. They have pulmonary hypoplasia because they don't have the rib cage. They have muscle weakness. The moment they're born, they would require ventilator support because their lungs do not develop well. They also present with seizure, which in one per 2,430 people. So these are not, it's called a rare disease, but it's not that rare. It's actually much more common than Cushing syndrome. Um, so these patients have autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. I believe my index case is autosomal dominant. Uh, they either present with fractures, short stature, poor mobility, craniosynostosis and increased intracranial pressure, premature loss of deciduous teeth, premature loss of secondary teeth, musculoskeletal pain, metatarsal stress fracture or stress fractures of the femur as in my index case, chondrocalcinosis, and pseudogout. And the mild form is even more common, one per 508 people. It usually is autosominal dominant and in, uh, present in adult age, and uh, it has nonspecific signs. So these are just some of the illustrations of the type of, you know, Look at this, this one has no, the roof of the skull is missing. All the ribs are missing. Mm -hmm. And then they have all this uh, bone uh, shiny tip, which they call metaphysial peaks, you know. And this is a bowing of the long bone, which you can also see on ultrasound. This one baby and come with born with hardly any bone. Look at that. So these are all hypophosphatasia. Uh, during childhood, you can do X-ray and you'll see loosen C at the end of their bone. So look at this. There's a hole in their bone. Uh, so. Uh, this usually present with juvenile onset hypophosphatasia. And if they keep on complaining of bone pain, an x-ray would be helpful. On MRI, they have increased lucency at the end of their bone. Again, showing that it's not a normal bone. 
in adults they get metaphyseal fractures so you can get this fracture and when they get the femoral fracture it always starts at the lateral aspect of the femoral bone which is what we call a typical fracture uh, so it it can be bilateral and it could be worse if you give them bisphosphonate because the, if you by mistake give bisphosphonate to patient with hypophosphatasia, they'll have severe fracture. They could also form chondrocalcinosis, so it's cartilage deposit in the tendon and you know, so you can see that here by x-ray. They have, you know, thin enamel, so this is another manifestation of the disease. And if you do CT scan of their bone, they have big holes here. So they're really, you know, there's a mineralization issue. This is the calcaneus, so it's a big hole on CT scan. So uh, how does hypophosphatasia present in adults, since we're, uh, most of us are adult endocrinologists. Uh, so the company, Election Pharmaceutical, which produced the uh, recombinant alkaline phosphatase for therapy of this condition, has been collecting global data. So they have the global hypophosphatasia registry. And they found that in adult onset disease, uh, the earliest manifestation of the disease usually occurs at about 32 years old, but it takes a long time uh, to diagnose them. On average, it, they, they are or they were diagnosed at 43 years old. Majority of the patients have musculoskeletal complaints and uh, the more symptomatic they are, the lower their alkaline phosphatase levels tends to be. 73% uh, of the patients are female. Uh, they, they have a lot of pain, bone pain, muscle pain, about 75% of the patient. Uh, they usually have orthopedic procedure, about 45%. And they have history of poorly healing fractures. Uh, foot pain from stress fractures of the metatarsal is very common, 21 to 23%. Thigh pain related to atypical femoral fractures usually can occur, and it usually starts with the lateral cortex of the subtrochanteric diaphysis. Again, it looks like the atypical fractures that you see with bisphosphonate therapy. And when usually the bone mineral density measured by DEXA scan will be normal. But we, this, we know that DEXA scan do not measure the matrix quality. It only looks at the, you know, calcium deposit. So usually the bone density could be normal. Uh, they usually have chondrocalcinosis. So they have the calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition in the cartilages, as I've shown you on the x-ray. And it's mainly in the knees, pubic symphysis, hips, and wrists. At the same time, even though you lack mineralization in the bone, you have a paradoxical deposition in the uh, tendons. So you have a lot of periarticular calcifications in the shoulders, elbows, wrists, hips, or Achilles tendon. Again, you have to consider this diagnosis if they have a poorly healing or recurrent fractures, especially if it's a metatarsal stress fracture. Well, I remember I've seen a lot of patients with metatarsal stress fracture. It's a foot fracture. I said, okay, it's not bone fragility fracture of osteoporosis. 
but never thought of hypophosphatasia. If they have joint dislocation, chronic muscle or bone pain, muscle weakness because ATP gener generation is affected, fatigue, immobility, osteoarthropathy, osteomalacia, joint pain from pseudo gout or CPPD disease, uh, chondrocalcinosis, and nephrocalcinosis like what my patient is presenting because they don't use the, their calcium is not incorporated into the bone. What happened is they will have hypercalcuria. Uh, and sometimes if the disease is very severe, they could also present with hypercalcemia. Sometimes they will have ophthalmic calcification, adult tooth loss, abnormal dent dentition, premature loss of the teeth with intact roots. The approach to the treatment of this patient usually require a team approach not only an endocrinologist, but you need to have orthopedic people, geneticists, uh, rheumatologists, uh, nephrologists, and all of these uh, uh, ancillary, uh, lots of specialty taking care of one patient because they truly present with systemic symptoms. So what are the goals of treatment? In infants and neonates, it's control of seizure. Uh, in children, it's improved mobility and functional status like to increase their strength, endurance, and improvement of gait, to improve the growth, pain, and fatigue reduction, improve fracture healing, reduce the number of fractures or pseudo fractures or insufficiency fracture, prevention of nephrocalcinosis and renal stones, which my patient have, uh, preservation of dentition. So what are the treatment options? In perinatal cases, when the rib cage is underdeveloped, they would require ventilator support. They would also require pyridoxine to treat their seizures. In children, if their cranium formation is a problem and they develop craniosynostosis, they would require neurosurgery. They also routinely have to be on low calcium or low phosphate diet. What is most important to remember is anti-resorptives use like bisphosphonate or denosumab are harmful as they reduce the bone turnover and lead to even greater reduction in bone strength. In fact, bisphosphonate is a pharmaceutical analog of inorganic pyrophosphate. So the structure of bisphosphonate is actually very similar to what is accumulated in hypophosphatasia. So if we're going to start anybody on anti-resorptive treatment because of osteoporosis, it's important to look at their alkaline phosphatase level to make sure that they do not have hypophosphatasia. Uh, Teriparatide has been shown to improve alkaline phosphatase level, but uh, the moment you stop the treatment, you get the clinical deterioration. Uh, Antisclerostin antibody has been shown to increase bone formation markers and increase uh, bone mineral density measurement also. The new treatment of, on the block, I think it's available for four, since 2017 or 2016, is asphotase alpha. So what is asphotase alpha? Commercially, it's called extrinsic. 
It says soluble glycoprotein containing two identical polypeptide chains, and these chains comprise the catalytic domain, the active part of the uh, tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase, and it's attached to the FC domain of human IgG. Then they also add a peptide that target the entire alkaline phosphatase molecule into the bone. And it's usually administered three to six times a week as a subcutaneous injection. And the FDA approved uh, indication is treatment of patients with perinatal onset and pediatric onset disease. So note, the adult onset disease has not been approved for this use. So this is how it looks. They, they have two polypeptide of the active part of the alkaline uh, phosphatase gene, okay? And then they have formed this disulfide bond attached to the human IgG FC domain, and they add some part of it that will target it to the bone. This is a study of 21 adults given, given asphotase alpha. This is their baseline alkaline phosphatase, and after receiving alphotase alpha, their alkaline phosphatase level go up. This is a, a two-year study. Their urine phosphoethanolamine level goes down. In this case, they did the 24-hour urine collection so that they can divide it by creatinine. So the um, substrate that tends to accumulate with this condition do go down with uh, this enzyme treatment, recombinant enzyme treatment. Uh, the osteocalcin will go up in uh, three to six months of treatment and went back to baseline. The procollagen type 1 and propeptide uh, level go up again on the third and six months and then went down. Uh, the trap uh, 5B, which is tartrate resistant acid phosphatase 5B, which is a measure of um, uh, formation and, you know, uh, uh, breakdown of the bone is elevated at three months and then went back to normal. And the uh, uh, NTX, that's the N terminal telopeptide. Or is uh, suppressed at 24 months. And these are just, you know, a few patients, 21 adults with, um, they showed that the bone density goes up with increased duration of treatment. Although, as you can see, the standard deviation is quite large. So what they showed is this asphotase alpha will enable bone remodeling and bone turnover on previously unmineralized surfaces of the bone. Remember, it's like a, a dynamic bone because you're not adding any uh, calcium hydroxyapatite into the bone. So essentially, you're going through the cycle of bone formation and bone breakdown once you uh, give them recombinant alkaline phosphatase treatment. There are side effects, including ectopic calcification, especially in the eyes. You can get all this purple hypersensitivity uh, reaction in the injection site. And you had to monitor their compliance by mo checking their alkaline phosphatase level. You also have to me measure their serum, calcium, phosphorus, renal function, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, and check their vitamin B6 level. Uh, there's a group of expert, uh, 
oh, this is an example of somebody, a child who was treated with asphotase uh, alpha for two years. See, all this rachitic bone, bowing of the bone, you know, he, she, he has significant uh, nacne. And then with treatment, you know, essentially straighten quite a bit of, you know, hormone. This is a two-year treatment. And there's a group of experts who went through um, the list of things that you have to monitor once you are giving the patient asphotase alpha. So all of the substrate that tends to accumulate has to be uh, measured, including all the bone forming agents. And also to check the, the, you know, DEXA scan, MRI as indicated, check the dental progress with this treatment, their mobility and quality of life, etc. So, in summary, hypophosphatasia is actually a systemic disease. It involves, uh, the, although we tend to focus on hypomineralization of the skeleton and, you know, the deformities, the fracture, uh, the rickets symptoms, etc., they actually do affect growth and development, muscle strength and function, the dental issue, respiratory uh, symptoms when they're severe, the renal function, especially with hypercalcemia, hypercalciuria, and development of nephrocalcinosis and kidney stones, the neurologic part, which is the vitamin B6 responsive seizure, and uh, increased intracranial uh, pressure if they have craniosynostosis. So these are, we just need to pay attention not only to the bone, but all the systemic effects that occur with this disease. And the way to diagnose this is not only the measurement of low alkaline phosphatase activity in the serum, but also uh, you have to look at the substrate of the enzyme activity that tend to accumulate, including high vitamin B6 level, phosphoethanolamine, inorganic pyrophosphate, and although it's not required, you can do gene mutation analysis to uh, diagnose the case. So, thank you for your attention, and today's event code is 1281551. Any question? Thanks, Betty. Um, <clears throat> so you can either unmute and ask the question, or you can type it in in the uh, chat box, and we can look at that. Okay. So, so uh, there's a chat box. Okay. Doctor Rolofote. Hello. Okay. Oh, hi. So hi. the first question I got, uh, oh, Satya, what's your question? So uh, nice to have you. A couple of questions. One is, um, you know, the ALKFOS levels that go up after the injection, you know, very, very high levels. Is there any concern or, you know, like I have a patient and, uh, you know, I, I heard it's expected, but is there a way to adjust the doses or how does that No, work? they they come in, they, they uh, there's starting dose of the stringent, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, they come in, uh, they have to be calculated uh, two, four, six milligrams yeah, yeah. per kilogram mm -hmm. uh, per day. Mm -hmm. And it's usually start at three times a week, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you don't, I don't think you have to worry about the highly elevated. Of course, yeah, they are like 7,000. Just adjust the dose to lower Quite. dose. Yeah. Into. Mm -hmm. you know. The other thing, you, you can have a topical uh -huh. indication if you, you know, 
increase the dose too much. Um, so when, when we use Strensic in the pediatric population, we don't typically, you don't monitor, you don't titrate the dose based on the ALP level because you know it's going to be mm -hmm. significantly elevated. So it's not recommended that you um, use the ALP or even necessarily check it mm -hmm. because you know it's going to be high. Yeah. That's not necessarily mm -hmm. yeah. related with adverse events. Yeah. So actually, uh, the reason I checked, I didn't, I wasn't checking the ALKFOS intentionally. I just was checking her electrolytes and mm -hmm. it just happened to be there. It, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. And it's really terrifying when you see it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I read the media in the thousand. Yeah. 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 So, yes. But then my other question, you don't have to cut back the dose based, based on that. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So who's Another taking one. care of that, you know, uh, in Norton Hospital, somebody is taking care of the hypophosphatase. Must, must be Dr. Uh, Grantham. He's yeah, so um, we have a we have a multidisciplinary metabolic bone clinic that uh, myself and Dr. Hires participate in, and okay. so we see most of the kids who have just osteoporosis, but also the genetic disorders that cause metabolic bone disease. So, X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets and hypophosphatasia and OI. Um, so it's primarily me and Dr. Hires. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, because they, they told me, the patient told me her, you know, niece is, you know, going to Norton Hospital. So I was wondering who's the pediatrician who sees them. Yeah. We see a lot of, you know, juvenile onset osteoporosis here in this clinic. Dr. I'm always trying, trying to scratch my hair over <laughs> this, you know. Dr. Villapote, I had one more, one more question. Uh, which, you know, even uh, the uh, pediatric uh, team can answer. But um, so this is uh, the, you you had mentioned about, I had trouble ordering those labs also, other than ALKFOS and B6, the PEA and that. And you said something about Mayo Clinic? Yeah. So I just called the lab and they said, just give uh, Mm -hmm. Spot urine if the, you don't need the creatinine or do the 24 hour urine collection. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, order it, you know, on the computer. No, yeah, on I had the trouble ethic, getting I the said PA. other lab tests and then specify mm -hmm. what I need, which is the urine phosphoethanolamine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the genetic test, I just said. It refer to the medical geneticist, and this is the gene that has to be checked. And then they came back already with the mutation. Alexia, they did the pre authorization, etc. You know, the good thing, the geneticist here is not very busy. So oh. she's eliciting business. Yeah, they are very busy. There's a long <laughs> one year waiting list. Oh, yeah, that's a crazy, you know. So that's the problem with uh, U of L geneticists. It's, you know, very busy here. She's only doing cancer genetic. Mm -hmm. So she has a lot of time. Yeah, I the can Center anytime. is very busy. Yeah, I, I think you have a question in the chat box from uh, Lisa. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I saw the chat box. So the way to make the diagnosis is first, you have low <laughs> alkaline phosphatase level. Uh, you just have to, have to make sure it's really less than 40 or uh, based on the age of the kid or the, you know, teenager, that it's below their uh, normal range for their age. And then you can use vitamin B6 level. That's very sensitive. And the spot urine phosphoethanolamine, which is actually quite easy to do because I have been doing it many times already with the, you know, patients because I have many patients suddenly with low alkaline phosphatase. I don't know, maybe it's the lab error. So Betty, to follow up on your answer, this is this is Lisa. Hello, lovely to see you. Hi, Lisa. Um, my, my, my specific question is, if you find this isolated low alkaline phosphatase, but the patient's otherwise fine, they're having no bone pain, no fatigue, their teeth are fine, they've never fractured. How 
eager would you be to perform further evaluation to look for this if they're asymptomatic and the whole purpose of treatment would be to improve their, their clinical picture and symptoms? Okay, so they're asymptomatic, but you don't know the degree of hypomineralization of their skeleton until they start having fracture. I would just settle for you know, uh, probably, you know, look at their bone more closely. And so that when they start having all those metatarsal fracture, uh, they will not be accidentally given bisphosphonate. Or bis but there's no need to treat a symptomatic you know? Remember, there's a mild form in adult that's very common. One out of 508 people will have hypophosphatasia. And, and there is, a, you know, uh, they have non-specific symptoms. So only if they start having uh, bone issues. But I will make sure that they not, they're, they're not hypertension, you know. You know, they won't have to do nephrocalculosis later. That's Just some routine tests, not in genetic testing is not required for diagnosis, really. Absolutely, a great talk. Um, this is Swabna. Just... Hi, Swabna. Right. Great to um, listen to you, Gwen. Um, one quick thing, uh, Lisa, I guess if you just have low alkaline phosphatase, um, there could be a whole big differential. It may not be hyperphosphatasia, so you, and there's no symptoms like, like you mentioned. You could probably just look to see if there's any of the other multiple conditions that Dr. Willow put up, including celiac, chromatosis, and rheumatoid. Right. That would be the reason for the low alphas and probably not hypophosphatasia at all. So yes. just that, um, you know, uh, yeah. that part was useful. Right. Dr. Bilopo, um, you know, in terms of... <laughs> uh, just a second, there's a no noise that I cannot hear you all. Yeah. Just a second, let me, you know. Okay, so now. So, um, yeah, uh, so I guess I have... Uh, so you have mentioned that low alkaline phosphatase may not always be present. You have a high suspicion because there's so many differential, uh, different presentations. Do you, do you just check a B6? Yes, I've been checking a lot of B6 lately. And you know what? I have one patient with just elevated B6, just a few points or sometimes more points above the upper limit of normal. Obviously, um, with no symptoms and no other clinical presentation, actually doesn't even have um, alphas. Okay. She's just coming off of her supplements, and I thought that was a little interesting. Um, yeah, so they okay. have to, uh, on the vitamin B6 measurement, uh, so it turns out it's best to do it in the fasting phase. Make sure that they're not on uh, vitamin. Vitamin B6 is very light sensitive. So um, make sure that the sample is light uh, because if they're with a fluorescent lamp, it will actually cutting in and out, but I guess that what you're saying is um, the levels will go up if it's not appropriately processed. Yes, so it has to be frozen immediately. It's very light sensitive. So if you expose it to light, the vitamin B6 level will go down go down, but what about up? I mean, this... No, no, up you know, you supplement or you have, you know, uh, hypophosphatation. It's yeah. easy enough to do the phosphoethanol. I mean, it's not... There are reference labs that run it. I think LabCorp is doing it also. What is it? I mean, with no really approved, approved treatment, 
guess it's probably an exercise. Yeah, I, I did not hear your question. Uh, I think everything. But that's okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, okay. <laughs> Any other question? Let me see. No chat, open chat window. So is there any way other than checking the levels, how actually would you monitor the treatment? The treatment? What is the outcome that you're finally looking for? Oh, uh, you will prevent fracture now that mm -hmm. you can mineralize the bone, at least an, at, at an adult age, you know, uh, you will decrease the bone pain, muscle ache, the joint pain of the patient. In this case, my patient has already multiple foot surgeries for bone fracture. She has already fractured her hip. Uh, so the, for the people who are, because there is such a wide, um, you know, spectrum of this disease in terms of clinical manifestations. Yes. You know? So is there any relationship between these 400 mutations and what they present with? Yes, uh, they, they cannot find any correlation so far. Uh, they cannot identify which part of the gene is um, mutated and how it w will it present as a autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant. Uh, this is a dominant negative gene. All you need is a one copy gene, and if it's autosomal dominant, that that other normal gene will not, you know, work. It's the mutated gene that will be, you know, manifested in terms of phenotype because it's an autosomal dominant gene we, that, you know, will take over even though you have one copy of normal gene. So this is probably what happened with my patient, you know, couldn't be another generation of consanguinity marriage in her age. So it's only her grandparents that are, you know, cousins, you know. So it's unlikely to be autosomal recessive in her case, but probably autosomal dominant. And as I said, it has a dominant negative effect. All you need is a one copy of the mutated gene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the treatment, it's not approved for adult, uh, you know, treatment. You may have, if they have fracture and the onset is adult, um, you you cannot prove that it's pediatric onset. You may just have to use the anti-sclerostin or teriparatide treatment mm -hmm. to strengthen their bone rather than, you, you know, it's very hard to get it approved. Okay. okay. Thank you very, very much. much. Very, very informative. Okay. Yeah. It's nice to see everybody again. Bye-bye. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye.